This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Governor Haslam rejects an insurance exchange and more negotiation over the future of the schools. Those stories and more coming up on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. Uh, tonight, a look at the week's biggest stories with a couple of journalists. Um, we've got Bill Dries from Memphis Daily News, Andy Meek also from the Memphis Daily News, and Eleanor, Eleanor Boudreau from WKNO-FM. Thanks for being here. We start with Bill, the governor, deciding um, up against the deadline to reject forming a state-run insurance exchange, one of the big major components of the Obamacare Affordable Care Act. Um, why did Governor Haslam reject it, and what are people saying about it? Well, Governor Haslam said that he could not really get the answers he wanted from the federal government despite 800 pages of regulations that he's been sifting through since after the November 6th elections. Uh, he, he was pretty harsh on the Obama administration on this one, saying that from looking at the rules, he believed that they were, in his words, making it up as they went in terms of the regulations that states would have to abide by in order to not only form but also run their insurance exchanges. Uh, so he decided, after it initially looked like the state might want to give it a shot, Governor Haslam said, basically, we don't feel like we could run it effectively, so the ball's in their court. And this doesn't mean, I think there were the, there were protesters of the Tea Party, or, you know, uh, uh, movement was very much opposed to this, as protested throughout the, the country that, you know, states shouldn't participate. There's some confusion in people who feel like this is a victory that, well, now Tennessee won't participate. That's not the case. There will be an ex insurance exchange mm -hmm. for Tennessee uh, for people to buy individual insurance coverage as laid out in the, the Obamacare bill. It's just that it'll be run by the federal government, not Tennessee. Is right. That the, there, there was always going to be an insurance exchange. The only issue to be decided here by the governor was whether the state would run it or whether the federal government would run it. It's and interesting. You didn't hear Bill say anything about cost. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the governor has said on a few occasions that what he's looked at, it wouldn't be much different cost-wise federal government versus the state-run thing. So a lot of people were surprised by the decision saying, well, if that's the case, it, well, why would you give up the control? Uh, I, I talked with an attorney this week who was pretty surprised, who handles employee benefits and this kind of thing. Uh, who, and it, the other thing is he wouldn't be the only governor of a red state who opted for a, a state plan. The kind of the philosophy has been, well, if you're, the federal government's going to be making us do this, then by God, we're going to control it. Right, you right. Know, So that's kind of the other it, it, consideration. And some of the politics, I mean, you've seen it in the other states, too. J Chris Christie has been in the news because of mm -hmm. Hurricane Sandy, you know, rejected, saying the same thing that Haslam did. We don't, we don't have enough details. We don't really know what we're doing. But there's a lot of people saying that these people are only bowing to political, um, you know, pressure. That the Tea Party, they don't want, you know, Haslam is known as a moderate Republican, a kind of pro-business Republican, doesn't want the, the, the ultra-right wing to be attacking him or his folks in the Republican Party down the road. And that even, even if it was smarter for Tennessee to run it, even if they could do it more cost-effectively, just being associated with Obamacare is poison. He, right. he made the, he tipped a nod to that in his statement, saying this is not politics. If it was, I would have made the decision a long time ago. It, not not minutes after his decision came out, Cohen comes out with, uh, Representative Cohen comes out with a statement. It's so politics, he said. Right, right. Eleanor. Yeah, well, this is the first big decision that Haslam has to make related to the Affordable Care Act. But the next one down the road is whether or not to expand um, Medicaid, which is in Tennessee is TennCare. And so... You know, and that's almost a bigger decision because if the governor chooses not to expand TennCare, then the federal government isn't going to do it for him. It simply isn't going to get expanded. And with that case, if he chooses to expand TennCare, it will cover more than 200,000 uninsured Tennesseans, um, and the federal government will foot the entire bill for that for three years. And after three years, the federal government will foot 90% of the bill. 
um, but if Haslam chooses not <laughs> to go for right. that, then it, it simply won't get done. And this goes back to the, the ruling, and forgive my Supreme Court you know, knowledge here, but the, the U.S. Supreme Court, when they ruled in the summer that Obamacare was legal, this was one, I guess you would say, loss for the, the, the Obama administration where they said that the, the federal government couldn't force the states to do this, so it became an option. Correct? It left the states with two big decisions, and the insurance exchange, you know, an online place right. where uninsured people can shop and compare health insurance, that was the first one. Um, but in that case, you know, if the states like Tennessee choose not to do it, the federal government will just do it for them. Um, the expansion of TennCare is, I, I think, a much more significant decision, and Haslam said that they're not related. You know, when he made the, the announcement about the insurance right. exchange to the downtown Rotary Club in Nashville, he said, these two decisions aren't related. I haven't made up my mind about TennCare yet. And there's no deadline on that one, so it's harder to tell when he's going to actually decide. There's no deadline. I don't understand that whole idea that there's no deadline. But, I mean, I've read that everywhere, that there is no deadline. But it, it basically goes into effect in a year. Isn't that correct? I mean, that this expansion of Medicaid, TennCare... He's got to decide at some point, I assume. Yeah, he, he does. I, I think the deadline was more associated with if he doesn't, then the federal government has to do something. Okay. So. Yeah, okay. Um, the, the, also, the politics on that, I think that, if I'm not mistaken, a bill has been introduced or that's been talked about in the state house in the upcoming legisla legislature to prevent the, the state from taking it. And it's one of those bills that probably won't go anywhere. Because, But it's there are a lot of, again, the, politi the politics of this, Andy, are Tea Party right-wing people don't want to touch Obamacare in any way, in any way that even if it is a big reimbursement rate, even if we can run the, ex the exchange better, we don't want to touch it. No, you're exactly right. I, that's, that's, that's the simple fact of the matter. Okay. Well, we move on from there to a discussion of the schools. Um, there were some updates this week, um, and we'll start with you, Eleanor. There's always a um, new bit of news. Um, last week when we talked, we were on the show, um, we had Jim Kyle on, state senator, who had proposed Kevin Huffman, um, the Department of Education um, director, to step in and mediate. That seemed sort of promising a week ago, but as the days went by, that's not going to happen, it seems. Yeah. I, I mean, in this... In this instance, we're just talking about municipal schools. And it's really hard to see where the common ground is on that because the suburbs want, you know, municipal school districts as soon as possible. And the sort of Shelby County Commission stance on that is that, you know, they don't want them, they're illegal. Um, they won uh, the, the judge's decision on municipal schools, uh, although he still has things to decide, so it's not over, but his initial decision was much more favorable to the Shelby County Commission than the suburbs. So it's it's really hard to see how they could talk this one out. Yeah, and Bill, your take on this. I mean, they're meeting today, the, the various parties, um, today as we tape this on Friday, um, the rep lawyers from the school, from the Shelby County Commission, lawyers from the, the municipalities, mm -hmm. to talk. Is something going to happen, or are we just going to go up to the next stage of the court case? The, the, the interesting thing about this discussion is, is how it's been framed. It's a discussion about should we have further discussions on that? Is there anything here that, that would serve as a framework for some kind of settlement or agreement down the road? Uh, one, of the, one of the more vital parties in all of this is also not at the table. The countywide school board got an invitation from the attorneys for the suburban mayors to the meeting. And Billy Orgel, the chairman of the school board, told his school board members about it earlier in the week and said, basically, we're going to go ahead and let them meet and work out whatever they want to work out, and maybe we'll be involved later. We're certainly open to talking, but we're not going to be at the meeting. Uh, we should also point out that the countywide school board technically is not a party to the lawsuit that's under discussion, but certainly if you're going to have an agreement, you have to include the countywide school board in the discussions. They're planning the school system that the suburban mayors are going to be part of for at least one year. And I want to come back to those, this, where we are with the planning because there's, there is a lot going on in terms of, and, and some would say not a lot going on in terms of that whole transition. But the next steps in the court case, there's the, we talk about this, but I want to keep track of it. There's the challenge to the segregation issue, the racial issue. That comes up next, most likely? Well, what, what, what comes up next is the second part of Judge May's ruling on the issues involving the Tennessee Constitution and the municipal okay. school district's laws. 
after and he... And were those, were those framed solely to target Shelby County? Right. And just the, the constitutionality of that, and that's where, as Eleanor was saying, I think y you hear that the county commission is feeling stronger, that if Hardy Mays on the first point said, you crafted this bill, state legislature, to target Shelby County, don't try to fool me, you, you did that. Right. That there's a, there, it would seem there's a better chance he's going to do that on this next one. That, again, this, you targeted Shelby County, so we're going to throw out the rule. So that's that's what you're saying is coming up next. Right. Then there's the whole challenge on the federal level of segregation and right. racial unfairness. Racial resegregation that the county commission alleges would be the case if you allow municipal school districts. That trial on that was supposed to start on January 3rd. That date has now been pushed back indefinitely. If the judge throws out the other two laws involving municipal school districts, you don't have a trial on the federal constitutional claims because it's a moot point. The laws are no longer on right. the books, so it, it, the federal constitutional questions are still out there, but they're pushed back further into 2013. Yeah, and so meanwhile, as you said, the, 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 the joint school board, the unified school board is meeting, trying to work through the issues of combining these school districts. Um, let's take the, the, the question about the ASD um, and the, the, the closing of schools first. So the Achievement School District, which is the state-run school district that came in, I guess, a year ago, year ago plus, mm -hmm. to take over failing schools statewide, many of them in Memphis, they are going to take over nine schools this year. Right. They will announce nine new schools that will be part of the Achievement School District for the school year that starts in August, which is also the first year of the school's merger. Uh, some of those schools will be run directly by the Achievement School District. Others will be run by charter organizations under contract with the Achievement School District. Um, it, it's not part of the school system's merger, but it's definitely impacting the merger. And there are a number of things that are outside of the strict boundaries of the merger process and the decisions to be made that, that will impact what parents and what students see on the very first day of that merger. Well, because you also get, and he said it on this show, Martavis Jones, uh, member of the school board, former city school board member, who said, look, getting into school closings, so everyone stay with me here, but that, you know, the TPC recommended 21 school closings because there are underutilized schools throughout the Memphis City school system. Uh, Martavius said, well, you've already got nine or ten of them closing because they're going over to the Achievement School District. So we only have to close another, I think, seven are on the table at this point. Um, I think some people debate his math on whether you count those ten Achievement School District schools as coming out of the budget. But on the seven that they've said, that they are going to talk about closing. Where does that stand? Well, it's now down to six, actually. Uh, Kreiner Cash, the superintendent of the Memphis City School System, had envisioned that the Achievement School District would go ahead and take Gordon Elementary, where there's already an ASD charter school operating separately within that conventional school. Uh, well, the ASD said, no, they're not on our list. They're not in the bottom 5% of, of, of underperforming schools in the state in terms of student achievement. So they're not on our list, so that's not going to happen. So Cash came back to the board this past week and said, well, Gordon's probably off the list, at least temporarily. So they're, they're only going to be six. And he's changing Humes Middle School to basically an optional school uh, which is involved in, in, in some of the back and forth with the ASD. And we're in, you know, the weeds of the decisions they're making right now, but this is kind of the, the, the heart of, of some of the, the criticisms that people on the outside have or, and the uncertainty about the process. And another point of uncertainty, Eleanor, is the optional program. Um, for some people, the Memphis City Schools optional program, White Station, you know, highly ranked nationwide as a public high school. Um, they've expanded the number of optional programs within schools. But it's unclear at this point whether those optional programs will continue next year? Yeah, well, the optional programs are, the optional schools are some of the best performing schools within the Memphis City School District and the state. And they're extremely popular. Um, but critics of the optional program say that they're not 100% equitable because of the way that parents get it, you know, have to stand in line to get in. And, you know, the district, so, so, so that's, that's the criticism. So the school board has to make a decision. Um, the Transition Planning Commission recommended that the optional program stay in place because they're, they're um, very popular. But we'll see what the school board decides. I mean, you've got to believe it. I mean, if they don't move forward with those optional programs, it's a new level of 
screaming about this because mm -hmm. because the, whatever you think about the fairness and so on about the optional programs and the way you know people spending a night in tents to get them the fact that people are spending the night in tents out on the street corner to get into these optional programs speaks that there's an avid core of parents who if this thing goes on too long and that isn't settled where the optional programs are going to be, they're going to go ballistic. Well, the Transition Planning Commission actually recommended that optional programs basically be expanded, so you get more optional, <laughs> optional right. programs. Um, you know, and and but there's a, a school of philosophy that says you know all the schools should be great right. schools. So basically, why don't why don't we aim to make all all the schools optional schools? Right. Right, right. away. Okay. Um, we'll leave that there, and again, you know, more to come, obviously, uh, every week on the schools. And we move now to buyouts um, from one of the biggest uh, corporate entities in town, FedEx, um, storied history in Memphis, huge presence in Memphis, Bill. Um, and they had announced, uh, you know, some months ago that there would be some restructuring, there would be some cutbacks, but basically it's, it's people being bought out to leave the company. Tell us what we know now about the shape of those buyouts, because it's a, it's a huge impact potentially on the company and the city. Right. FedEx executives have, have told analysts and investors that they are going to achieve $1.7 billion in profitability annually as a solution to their problems, primarily with, with FedEx Express, which is the oldest and largest division of the company. That's basically their, their air fleet that they had, and it's been the hallmark of the company. Uh, they still have not announced how many buyouts they're looking for, uh, what the dollar amount is that they hope to achieve in terms of toward the profitability on this. But they, but they have recently announced that, that they're going to start this. The packets go out to employees in February. It's going to be employees with five years of continuous service in the company who will get the choice among other criteria for it and that it's going to take about a year. They're going to do it in three phases um, at the same time that they're basically not just reacting to the problems with FedEx Express. They're also trying to find a new way of, uh, of doing things because their customers have, have shifted as a result of the recession, as a result of in better technology in some other sectors. Folks who are shipping packages are moving away from doing it by air. They've been doing that over several years now. So FedEx is having to adjust to that long term as well. Yeah, and I think also some of the, the slowdown in China. I mean, China was a big market for them. That that has slowed down air freight, you know, all the way around the world. Um, to the buyouts, particularly specifically, there no one knows exactly how many there will be. I think that's correct, but mm -hmm. it's estimated somewhere between three and five thousand people. I mean, is that that will ultimately take them? The the company has said thousands. They're going to offer four weeks of pay for each year of continuous service, capped at two years of base pay. And it, it's very generous. So, so they are expecting you know, employees to want this. Right, and, but not all in Memphis. There are 115,000 no. employees in FedEx. So to some, you know, we think of FedEx as our own, you know, as a civic sort of point of pride and so on. But these layoffs come all over the place. Is that but, right? Uh, but across the, the U.S. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. but, with, but within the U.S., I mean, I think that's the important part. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, we move on to another uh, company in Memphis, a storied name that in, to some degree is no more, which is Morgan Keegan, um, now Raymond James, bought by um, Raymond James from Regions Bank what, a, within the last year, Andy. Close enough. Um, but a, a kind of startling um, headline that came out this week that the SEC had filed charges against some big names mm -hmm. in Morgan Keegan, including Alan Morgan. The uh, Morgan Keegan has gotten a lot of heat over some bond funds that they used to have uh, at their firm. Uh, the, these would be uh, investments that um, you know the, the elderly and people looking to preserve their capital and their golden years would. Uh, they're supposed to be safe, not a lot of volatility. It's a whole other story, but those funds blew up. The SEC filed charges, a lot of regulatory stuff against the firm over that uh, about a year or so ago. And I don't care what anybody says, that's one of the reasons Regions was looking to get rid of Morgan Keegan, get a lot of that off of, you know, give it to Raymond James. Uh, that takes us up to now. Um, the charges this week that the SEC filed were against several directors at Morgan Keegan who supposedly, um, you know, according to the SEC, didn't exercise enough oversight of these funds, didn't know what was going on, and they were supposed to, according to federal law. Um, the SEC is a civil agency, so it brings civil charges, so uh, monetary is going to be the, the punishment. Not criminal, not jail time. Co correct, not, not criminal, not jail time. Um, you know, a, a lot of these participants in these funds were looking for um, as sure a bet as you can find in the investment world. Uh, 
I, I'll give you a sure bet. What's going to happen here is uh, settlement and no admission of wrongdoing by the people who were part of this. It's just the way all these things go. Well, like I mean, just not it's in the Memphis story, but it's a yeah. huge financial story. HSBC, the big sure. uh, British English bank that same, settles. Same I thing. mean, they were laundering money for the Iranians. They were accused of, and yeah. I mean, all these really nefarious yeah. things. No one goes to jail. No one gets indicted. That's they right. They pay that's a right. big, big fine, and, and it, that it, seems to be the model. And the other quick point about this is, um, I think Reuters took used this as an opportunity to say this is Exhibit A for all we need to bring back the Glass-Steagall Act, the old federal act that used to separate regular banks from investment banks, so you didn't have people, you know, inappropriately selling the other because they just want to enrich the other side of the bank. It's the focus was to be on what's best for the customer. Right. Um, and so when, the other thing that kind of struck me about the, this the was timing. the timing. Because yeah, yeah. I, I just thought, well, this was a long time ago. Now, that yeah. doesn't mean that those people who lost money, mm. we should just forget about sure, it. Sure. I don't mean it in an insensitive way, but it seemed like there would be a statute of limitations or, or something that, why didn't they do this years ago? Why are they only getting to it now? The, the only thing I've got for you at the moment is the SEC is a pretty slow agency when it comes to this. Right. I, you know, I, I remember talking to lots of state regulators who were following this from the get-go and kind of were holding back, waiting to see what the SEC does. They were just chomping at the bit, ready to go. And I don't know what those guys are doing, but the, the slowness factor, I think, is, is, is part of it. Okay. All right. Well, we leave that there and move um, into a quick sidebar of just, just quick touches on a number of small stories that are going on that will be developing. And you mentioned the SEC, which reminds me, in my strange way of thinking about things, of the, the big, other SEC. The, the other <laughs> SEC, which then reminds me of the Big East. Yeah. And um, I, you followed this some, I think, Andy. I mean, the, the whole story that the Tigers, after many years, the University of Memphis was going to join one of the elite big conferences, the Big East. It was going to be great. And now it looks like there is no Big East, uh, yeah. at least as we know it. No, I mean, you, you, you've, you've said it. That, that's pretty much the issue. Uh, there is some good basketball news. The Grizzlies keep, you know, exciting people. Uh, I, we were going to mention um, just, I think, yesterday, uh, the Grizzlies' new owner. I've totally hijacked your thing. Uh, the the uh, Grizzlies' new owner has hired an ESPN writer. Uh, right. who's a big analytics guy to sort of beef up uh, that side of the Grizzlies uh, department, bring a lot of money ball type stuff to player evaluations and things like that. And a lot of people are really excited about it. And in fact, the Grizzlies owner never tweets hardly. But last night, he's, you know, he made a big point of welcoming uh, John Hall, ESPN's John Hollinger to the, to the team. Yeah, that was a big deal. It yeah. was a big deal. And, and any announcement thoughts, the, the Grizzlies thing is a, is a positive news and they're doing really well and all that on the basketball sports, sports is business front. The Tigers, anyone, any thoughts? I mean, what, what happens next? I mean, uh, to some people would say, well, this shouldn't matter. It's just a sports story. But on the other hand, there's big money and there's big, you know, um, there's a lot of community investment in this sort of thing. It's more than just a sports issue. Well, I, I think it's interesting to watch how the two teams, the two franchises, if you will, have kind of shifted places. When the Grizzlies were not doing well, when they were really just treading water, their games were the games that people really weren't too excited about, you know, and, and the Tigers, meanwhile, were, were filling up FedEx Forum during the Calipari era. Sorry to use the C word, but, um, <laughs> but, okay. but, we're, but we're, now, now we've seen j just the opposite. A lot of people are going downtown to see these games at the FedEx Forum when the Grizzlies are right. in town, and a lot of folks here are, are, are watching. Right. Uh, another quick story to touch on from this week past is International Paper. Yes. Um, they, there was noise, um, Andy, I think you followed up for us, I mean, that they were going to, they wanted a pilot. They wanted tax incentives to say in the city of Memphis, they've got a number of big corporate um, um, headquarters in East Memphis, Germantown area. Um, they were talked they were going to move down to DeSoto County. It's kind of a story we've heard before, mm -hmm. and in the end, they get their tax deal. They're probably going to build a new building, etc. But this one was a bit more dramatic because early on they had floated the process of uh, wanting just an extraordinarily long tax freeze to the point that um, the people that the body that grants those would have to get approval from the uh, city and county legislative bodies. I think the state as well. Uh, and it just brought up this whole discussion. Uh, I mean, we've talked about this before: the dark side of economic development, given all you know, all this money for not a guaranteed result. Uh, they get, they could get the money moved tomorrow, next year, but uh, they there, there was a lot of noise about it. They ultimately decided for sort of to go up to the limit of what's palatable now: the 15 years uh, tax freeze. Uh, presumably, they will get that and stay here. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. And, and the other part of it is, I mean, I guess the good side is they're going to build a new building, yes. they've said. Yes. They're going to connect if you drive down Poplar and Poplar and They have um, several buildings. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and they're going to connect them. And there's a big investment. Mm -hmm. And they're moving how many people 
into town. They bought, I, International Paper bought Temple Inland, a competitor Texas, earlier this year. Texas government. And they're moving, a, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of people. So, I mean, all that, that's the good sure, side. Sure, um, sure, sure. All that, those people come, they spend money, they buy houses, they put their kids in school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But again, the critics are going to say these are giveaways, that these companies should be paying more taxes. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is the dynamic is the government is not trying to give a dollar more than they have to to, to win right. these companies. The companies have no incentive to just ask for what they need. You yeah, know? right, right. Um, other stories from the week that anyone had, I, I was going to go ahead and say and preview a show that, that comes up next week, Bill, when we sit down with... Um, a number of people from green organizations, as I like to say, um, Overton Park, um, Shelby Farms, The Green Line. Thoughts on that real quick before, as we go into the holiday season, that's a show that, again, we should preview it for next week. Well, it, we'll, we'll be talking primarily about the Overton Park Conservancy, the Shelby Farms Park Conservancy, and the Memphis Area Green Line, uh, which is kind of the, 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 the connection between those two very different institutions in, in our city that, that have something in common. And the fact that they're, they're both expanding, uh, they're both opening their access to the public, and we'll see more of that in the year to come. So we thought that was kind of a, a good way to, to move toward the end of the year. And we wanted to have, you know, the bike lane people, um, we, we just we couldn't get everybody on, but that's another thing you see, you know, these bike lanes connecting all these places and people like uh, uh, Diane Ream, who who's the head of the Memphis Green Line, is an incredibly enthusiastic uh, person about the future. So it was a good conversation. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Good night.